His story, by the grace of God, includes us. But it is about him. It is about him, not what he can do for me, what he's, gonna, what he's done for me. This is what he's done for me. It's about him.
Father, we just come to you this evening and uh, we just thank you so much for all that you've done in our lives. And, uh, and just the praise, the praise that you are so worthy of from us. Father, I pray that uh, this next hour uh, and the next time we spend together, I just pray it would just be so glorifying to you. And, uh, and we, had, we would have such soft hearts uh, so that you could just move in us, Father, and we could, uh, we could just feel joy. Joy because you are our dad. Joy because you are so good. And it doesn't matter what you do for us, but you are good. And because you're so good, you do those things for us, Father. Um, I just pray over the rest of our evening, and uh, amen. Well, good evening. Thank you so much, worship team. So, so true. Open the eyes of our heart. Man, that could not be more fitting than uh, the uh, introductory prayer to tonight's talk. And uh, if you're listening online, if you didn't get to hear the, the uh, worship tonight, I'll oh, just go find somewhere that played that song. Uh, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. I, I, I Man, I pray that that's your prayer uh, here tonight uh, as we... As we uh, take a look at his word. So did you bring your Bibles tonight? Good. Did you grab them. You're going to need them. I'm not going to. I know there's been a couple of weeks where I've just been like blazing through and there's no chance to keep up. This is not one of those nights. So uh, I would encourage you to have your Bible. There's some, some real easy ones to find tonight as well. Uh, if you're new to the Bible, we uh, believe that this was written by people, real men and women who are really inspired by the God of all creation. Uh, and there's... The, the, the words that are on these pages, they're, they're more than just a, a book. They, there's something about them that speaks to the deepest part of us. And uh, for those who know, you know, it, it, it affects us in a different way than, than anything else. And uh, Jesus alone has the words of life. And uh, we've decided we're not going anywhere else. We're going to find our, find our hope in him. And so, like Zach mentioned, we want to help people find Christ in community. One of the ways we do that is through studying His Word. So let's, uh, we're going to jump in tonight. We're starting a brand new series. You saw the title up there, Made in My Image. And uh, maybe I just want to start with this. When you hear the word image, what comes to mind? What do you think of when you hear the word image? You know, the dictionary definition will tell us it's something physical uh, or, it's the, or the impression, the impression of something seen by the public. So it's not even necessarily that it's, you can see it physically, but it's this, it's, we have the ability to see with our mind's eye and it's this perception of, of someone or something that we want to be seen. We have our own self-image. We want people to see us in a certain way. And uh, our world and our culture are obsessed with it, uh, obsessed with image. Uh, it's like, what does the world think of me? You know, they buy these name brand expensive things, you know, so that people will know that they're rich. And what's really funny to me is that we live in a world where people buy fake name brand stuff so that you think they're rich. And you think about that, they're not, they're not buying it for the quality because the quality's not there. Uh, and, and they're just spending extra money on clothes that are, you know, just the same quality, but it'll make people think, man, there's something. What is that? That's image. You know, we have our uh, perfectly photoshopped photos that we place uh, on Instagram or the filters will do it for us so that you can look at me uh, or having to be in every picture of beautiful art and sunsets and, and things now is is the new norm. You know, it's not an I was chatting with a guy who just came back from uh, Europe and he was at a museum where they got to see the Mona Lisa. And he says, you know, 20 years ago when he had been there to see the Mona Lisa, he says we'd all there was crowded and people would be there and they would, you know, want to take pictures of the Mona Lisa. He says now when people are there, they got their phone out and Mona Lisa's there and they're like, hey, Mona Lisa and me. Right. Like I want to be in the photo so everybody can know I was there. It's all about me. A world that revolves around me. I don't know about you, but it's my favorite topic. It's, uh, you know, my favorite perspective, my pursuit. If I'm honest, it usually has something to do with me. And I think if we're honest, the underlying motivation of most of our decisions is really how it affects me. We've become addicted to the apps and social media that celebrate all things me. 
We have endless tools to discover me. You know, the Enneagram, the disk system, the colors, the temperaments, you name it. This was an ad saying these are the 14 personality trait tests you need to know for this year. Why? What is that? It's like the, I just got to find out more about me. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, when we think about it sometimes, we, we look around, we find, you know, me trying to find other me's who, uh, who would be willing to celebrate me. And what I usually find is other people who want to celebrate them, and they want me to celebrate them. I want you to like my photos. I'm not going on there to, tr- you know, first off, I might like yours, so hopefully you'll like mine back, right? It's, it's these kind of me-focused things. And there's this, there's the, maybe I say that, that conflict of desire on the inside, because we want me, but we also want community. And we find out that those two things, they're, they're at, at uh, odds often. And it's like two ships passing in the, du- in the night where they don't, they don't seem to meet. As long as I'm trying to please me, I can't find true community. And we find people just become like islands, more and more isolated, more and more distance from one another. That's why we're so passionate about helping people find community. And when I think about all that, tonight's not a talk on community. It's not, not even a talk about me. What I, what I wanted to chat about tonight is that I, I, I'm beginning maybe to realize For the first time, or just maybe more than ever, how much that mindset affects our perspective of God, our view of his word and of truth. How much that affects us. And so, you know, this past uh, week I sent Zach a video of a church in the... In California, I believe it's California. No, it's not California. It's somewhere... somewhere, It's in the States. Um, If you're from the States and listening, you guys have some serious problems down there. Uh, (laughs) There's this pastor, and he's preaching a message... Uh, on this topic, he's like, you know, we talk about worshiping God, but what if it's God who actually worships us? For real. And he preaches this whole sermon. There's tidbits and snippets of it. If you want to listen to it, I can send it to you. But at the end, his worship leader gets up and says this, we declare to you that you are the God who worships us. I know. And we're like, wait. We have this shock. We're like, wait a second. How, how did anybody get that far down the road? You know, I think, uh, I think that that's the, the end result. And hopefully the end, maybe it goes further than that, of this, this really this, this thing that, that is so me-focused that we'll even fall to that spot where it's like God is about me. And you know, to be fair, I think that's a really tricky thing for us to notice in ourselves. We are honest and say, yes, now that you've brought it up, I'll admit it. But we probably didn't think about that much today because it's not something we see out there. We're like, oh, yeah, that's a problem. It's here. It's like that affects our, it affects the way we see everything. We become, you know, uh, so, so uh, me focused that what ends up happening to us is we want a God who's going to reflect us rather than being a reflection of him. Uh, We're tempted to create a God, like the title says, that's made in my image as opposed to realizing that I'm made in his image. Uh, And it's not a new concept. You You can find lots of sermons on this topic of God in our image. And I think the reason is because that's repeated in every single generation. I know that I'm tempted to do it all the time. I know that I'm tempted to read myself into these pages as if this is about me. And tonight, I pray that Holy Spirit leads each and every one of us into the realization of whose story it really is. And may that affect our lives once again uh, as we remind ourselves about some of the things that we look at in life. And we're looking at me, 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 and missing out on the one, the creator of all. So we're going to jump in tonight. If you have your Bibles, go to Genesis 1. Verse 1. we got to go all the way back to the beginning. And I was just prepping for this. I was reminded of the movie, The Little Rascals. Uh, and The Little Rascals, they talk about their go-kart, the blur, that hasn't lost since the beginning of time. Five whole years. And I think we, it's all these little kids. That's when time began for them. And for me and you, I think we, we base our you know, understanding of time on our time. But our time is not what matters in this story. It is time in general. And so Genesis 1 verse 1, it says this. In the beginning, in the beginning of time, God created the heavens and the earth. We really don't have to go any further than that word in yellow. The fourth word, in the beginning, God. He simply, as this begins to be written, as one long story, it reminds us of what it's and who it's all about. In the beginning, God. Nearly every translation into English translates it exactly that way. 
There's no like, you know, there's no clever play on words here. It starts the same in all of them. In the beginning, God. And then Genesis describes all that God creates. If you just go down a little further, you come to uh, verse 26, and he creates all of these things in, in, um, in between, right? Animals and plants and creates this great garden. And then verse 26, then God said, because it's his story, he says, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. And let them, because it's, he's creating mankind, he says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. He's like, These, this creation's special. They really are. They really are. And verse 27, he says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then God saw everything that he had made in verse 31. And indeed, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. You know, these very good creations, this, this crowning of his creation, mankind, it wasn't too long before they had this desire to be their own God. It's like they already got to that spot of like, we're created in his image and we're like him, but they wanted to be, in a sense, more like him if it was even possible. And obviously it wasn't possible. They rebelled against the one true God and that original act, we call that sin. And it, sin infected everybody and it led to this continual cycle of sinful actions in mankind. And the wages of that sin led to death and removal from the garden. And most of all, just this disconnect between them and the real God. And that longing has been there ever since. Then as the population of the planet grows, goes from two, and anytime you get two, you get more. Uh, and so uh, what ends up happening is there's this population growth from Adam and then once again from Noah. And it grows. As it grows, they also grow. But they grow more distant from the God of all creation. And then God chooses a man out of the mix. He's like, Abraham, we're going to start with you and we are gonna, we're going to fix this. But finds out Abraham's just as sinful as everyone else. But the redemption plan, God's plan, God's story has begun. And we got Isaac, and we got Jacob, and we got Joseph, and we got the brothers, and we got Israel, and the generations. And it goes on until they become enslaved in Egypt. And that's when a guy named Moses arrives on the scene. And God uses him to deliver these people from Egypt and out of slavery. And once they're out of Egypt, God gives them what we know as the Ten Commandments. You can go to Exodus chapter 20. So just go to the right a little bit. Exodus chapter 20, you know, we hear about the Ten Commandments. Sometimes people think those are, you know, these are the rules the world is supposed to live by. But they're not. This isn't what God was doing. He wasn't like, hey, if you can keep these rules, you can be in my family. He said, listen, I rescued you out of Egypt. I'm already your God. I'm already, I've put myself out there to invite you into my family. But in my family, we have some family rules. It's the same as this. I can't tell Isaac Chickam what time he has to be home tonight. He's not my kid. You know, his parents can't tell my kids. Why? Because they're, they're not in their family. Every family has their family rules. And here's the ones for the family of God. And here's how he starts. He says this in Exodus 20, verse 1. Then God gave the people all of these instructions. Verse 2. I am the Lord your God. He's reminding them of whose story this is. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, from the place of your slavery, and you must not have any other gods but me. You must not make for yourself an idol or any kind of image of anything in the heavens and the earth or in the sea. You know, God reveals himself to this people once again, but he can't reveal himself in a way that they can see him. Anyone who sees God in a sinful state dies. He's like, I could show you myself, but then you're all dead. And so he's like, let me, let me reveal yourself, myself to you by rescuing you. I'm going to save you out of slavery. That should be enough to realize, okay, there's a God. He's Lord over all creations. He, he controlled, you know, the, the, the Red Sea parting. He controlled the frogs, the flies, the gnats. Like, he's the God of creation. We, we, we can see that. And he says, let me, you've seen, you've seen what I can do. Now let me explain this connection and he says, in this, in this family rules, he's like, don't even try to make an image of me. I know you can't see me, and I know you want to see me, but don't even try and create an image of me. You know, other uh, writers would further explain the futility of that very uh, endeavor. Uh, it's foolish. Go to Isaiah chapter 44. Keep going to the right. Isaiah 44. Well, you're on the way there. Isaiah is writing... He's writing um, 
to the nation of Israel. And he begins describing some people. He begins describing the, the, the folks who were creating idols. First, he talks about the one who makes idols out of metal. And then he talks about this guy. He's like, he's like, there's a man who goes out and he plants a tree because it's the right kind of wood. And then when it grows, he tends it. And then he cuts the tree down and he uses part of the tree in his kitchen to make some bread and to heat his house. And then he takes the other part of the tree while he's sitting there and he begins to carve it into an, to an idol. You know, he, he carves it to look like a little human figure, and then he gives it human beauty, and he puts it in this little shrine, and then he falls down on his face, and he worships it, and he prays to it and says, Rescue me! Save me! Isaiah writes this in Isaiah 44, verse 18. Such stupidity and ignorance, which I think we would all agree he says, their eyes, they're closed. How, how can they not see? He says, their minds are shut. They cannot think. Verse 19, the person who made the idol never stops to reflect and say, why, it's just a block of wood. I burned half of it for heat. I used some of it to bake my bread and roast my meat. How could the rest of it be a god? Should I bow down to worship a piece of wood? He doesn't even ask himself. It says, the poor deluded fool feeds on ashes. He trusts something that can't help him at all. Yet he can't even bring himself to ask, is this idol that I'm holding in my hand a lie? He's saying, you know what? You can try and make an image, but it's futile. And if you think about it, you've just, you've just tried to create your own God. How crazy is that? Job would tell us later on that it's impossible Impossible. Um, I'm not, we're not going to read all of Job, but I would encourage you to read Job uh, 38 to 42, all those chapters. Fascinating, fascinating words that the Lord has with this man named Job. Job's the guy who had a lot of bad stuff happen in his life. And he's basically like, God, <laughs> he, I have a beef with you. I have issue with you. You obviously don't control everything. You obviously don't know what's going on because look at my life. Here's all the things that have been going on. And he, he challenges the Lord. Well, God actually turns around and challenges Job in these chapters. He's like, okay, Job, he says, you've done enough talking. You've had 37 chapters to talk. It's my turn. And these last four chapters, he challenges Job and he points him to the very thing that everyone else has, creation. He's like, Job, let me ask you something. You know, you know so much about me and, and all of these things, but do you understand the planets? Do you understand the one you're even on? Were you there when it was formed? Were you there when I spoke it into being? Do you understand how the sea stays where it's supposed to and the land is where it's supposed to? Like, do you control the weather? Do you even understand how the weather works, Job? How do you know the, you know, the timing of the sun at rise and sunset? And, and are you able to control that and change it? Do you understand the heights of the mountains? Have you been there, Job? Have you experienced what it's like to be way, way up there? Or how about the depths of the sea? Have you been to the bottom of the trench and seen what goes on down there? He's like, no, 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 you haven't. What about the animals, Job? He's like, you're so smart. Do you even understand how the animals know how to find each other, produce their young, know where to give birth, and then the, the, the young leave the moms and just, they go and find it out all on their own, and, and they survive in the next generation? Job, do you understand how that happens? Do you realize that the plants, when they grow, they produce these seeds? Do you know how they grow? And Job, he's beginning to catch on. And he says to the Lord, he's like, Lord, uh, you're right. I, I, I don't know what I'm talking about. And the Lord says, I'm not done yet. <laughs> he goes on to say, Job, what about power? What about justice? What about pride and humility, mercy and strength? Do you think you understand the fullness of all of those things? And it really, he just simply says to Job, if we were to paraphrase it, Job, you're not smart enough. You're not powerful enough. You're not wise enough. You're not timeless enough to accurately describe me. You don't have it in you to describe the God of the universe. Job, basically, you're not God. You're not God. Job 42, Job humbly just admits his ignorance, and he repents, and he's like, Lord, I was wrong about you. What I thought about you, the image that I had of you in my mind, it is, it is foolish. It is not right. And he repents in that moment. You know, God's command to the people of Israel not to create an image, not to even try. Some would try and create the image physically. Others created it in their mind. But he says, don't create an image of me at all other than who I am. And that lasted about 30 seconds. 
Moses left, went up the mountain. Guess what they did? They made an image of a calf and said, Woo, this is the God who saved us. They began bowing down. And we could blame them, but it happened in the next generations. You know, we see it in Judges, how they would serve the Lord and then fall away, be drifted away. Then they, we go through the Chronicles of the Kings, and they're the same. They continue to drift away until Christ. Then Paul describes the same existence of this creating images of God in our minds and in, in physical ways in his letter to the Romans. So you can flip to the New Testament, going all the way. It's Romans chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. Paul's writing a letter, obviously, to the Romans, and he's explaining to them that this is still happening in real time. Romans 1, verse 18, but God, God, he brings it back around again. This is who the story is about. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people. Just remember that verse for a minute. We're, we're going to come back to it. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people. It's almost like, you know what? I, I, really, don't, I really don't want that verse in there. I, I don't really like that, that verse all that much. Why, why do we have that feeling? We'll find out in a minute. He says, the, the, he says his anger burns against sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he's actually made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, here we go again, back to creation, back to the beginning. He's like, ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and they've seen the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature. They have no excuse for not knowing God. He's like, you can see that this has all been designed. And he says, just, it, doesn't take, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look out and realize, somebody made that tree. And I'm pretty sure it wasn't anybody who lived before me. There's something out there. God's like, yeah, exactly. I've left it all clearly there for you to see my divine attributes. It says they had no excuse for not knowing God. Verse 21, he says, okay, yes, they knew God. They would agree. They would consent. There must be a God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God is like. What is that? That's right there, again, the image in my mind of who God is. He's like, they have these foolish ideas of what God is like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools, like the man who's like, oh, I'm going to worship the thing I just made. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. They had a chance to know God, to know the truth, but they suppress that truth with these images that they have of him. They come up with foolish ideas of what God is like. They begin to worship idols that look like mere people. What is that? God's made in my image. They look like people. They look like men. You know, I read a story this week about uh, in Luke. In Luke's account, you can go to Luke. It's just flipping back to the left there. Luke 7. Read this account, and I've read it many, many times. Every time that I've read through the Bible or even the New Testament, I've come across this story in Luke chapter 7. I've preached about it a number of times. <laughs> Learned lots of great things as a result as, uh, as far as worship is concerned. And as I read it again this, this uh, past week, it struck me. It's just like something jumped out to me, and I'm like, man, I have not seen that before. You have that? That's, you, that's usually the Holy Spirit's voice. So I... As I was reading about this, we usually read about this woman and who goes and anoints the feet of Jesus. And most of the time we focus on her and her, uh, her incredible gift of worship to God for what he's done for her. But this time I want to focus on a different player in the story today. And so this, Luke 7, verse 36. One of the Pharisees, um, they were religious leaders, they asked Jesus to have dinner with them. And so Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. And then a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there. And she brought this beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. And she knelt behind him at his feet and she was weeping. Can you picture it? Her tears falling on his feet. She wiped them with her hair and she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, he's thinking this. If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Just leave that verse up there for a minute so you can see it in, in yellow. If this man were a prophet, he would. What's Simon doing? 
Simon is, is revealing his, his thoughts, his image of, of who a prophet should be. If, a pro- if this guy's really a prophet, he should know that this woman, like he should have the power to know. He doesn't realize that it's God in a body. He doesn't even realize who Jesus is, but he's coming up with foolish ideas of who God is. He thinks that this person, if they, you know, if he was a prophet, if he was the son of God, he should, or he would, or he could. You remember any other times where that phrase was mentioned? If you're the son of God? Man, that's the devilish question if there ever was one. In the garden, you know, in the, in the wilderness, it's like, if you're the son of God, you could do this. You should do this. This is my perspective, my idea of, of what God would be like and who God is like. And Jesus actually challenges Simon, reads his thoughts and answers them. That's a powerful thing to think about. But he answers Simon's thoughts and he reveals to Simon in that moment who God really is. He gives us a great opportunity to see what God is really like. And my hope today is this, that if we, like you and me, have these thoughts of these, these, these really the foolish image of if, if you were God, if God is, you know, if God, if God is like this, that we would have that same revelation on the inside of who he really is. You know, I was reminded as prepping for this of my son, Max, uh, when he was five, we, uh, he's, he's, he's a, he's like a, He's a keener, like he really gets into the Bible stories, he's listening, and you can have conversations with him, and we were talking about, uh, you know, the, the children of Israel, and they were bowing down to idols, and how terrible that is, and, and then afterwards, you know, shortly, it was the same day, at some point, all of a sudden, he wanted an app on Beth's phone that he would, could, could play, and she's like, no, I'm not putting that app on that phone, and he just looked at her with that look, you know, kids get, and he's like, if you don't put that up on, my, on the phone right now, I'm going to bow down to an idol, <laughs> <We're> like, <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. I really don't know what to do with that. You know, we think about that, we laugh because we're like, yeah, we don't bow down to idols anymore today. We, we would all agree that that other guy is foolish. We, we just, we're not bowing down to idols. And yet I would challenge us to think about that before we answer that. Because I do think we tend to create our own idols and we bow down to them. We worship them without even realizing it. How often we'll put physical wealth uh, as a priority above the Lord, how we'll put comfort, our comfort, above his commands. We'll put our pleasures uh, in this world over prioritizing his presence. We, we will do it. And we don't realize it because we don't see it in here until it gets revealed. And it's our own foolish ideas of what God is like. We have them as well. And a lot of times we came by him honestly. You know, we listened to some preachers in our church or whatever. They told us things. I, I look at my own life and think back to how many different times I've had weird ideas about who God is that got corrected by his word later on. But I believe them to be true at the time. You know, or the experiences we go through. And we're like, oh, okay, man, I went through this. God must be like this. Or our circumstances we find ourselves in. And we're like, oh, I guess God is like this. Possibly. Highly likely foolish ideas of what God is like. You know, I think uh, how, how many uh, people I just read about and even know, I know of some, who are deconstructing their faith. Deconstructing their, and I've put faith in quotation marks because the God that they heard about doesn't line up with their views of life today. And they're like, well, one of us is wrong. And instead of realizing, oh, it's me. That's like there must be something wrong with God and Christianity, and they deconstruct. They say things like this, you know, well, God would want me to be happy. And I'm miserable in this marriage, so he probably is good with me yet now. God, you know, you, you, you talk about the cross, and the, we all needed to be saved, but I'm really not that bad of a person. Like, I shouldn't have to feel all this guilt that I'm feeling. And they begin to realize and say, you know what, I, I'm not actually not that bad of a person. And what happens when you go down that road? Well, I don't need a cross anymore. And if I don't need a cross, well, then I don't need Christ. And they deconstruct from their faith. If God was really good, he would do this, this, and this. If God were. Man, they're devilish statements. Devilish statements, devilish questions. And say we can find ourselves there. But the other one is even this. It's revelation bias. It's where something becomes real to us from the scripture, and then we think it's all that and that alone. You know people like that? It's like you buy a car, and then everybody else has that car. You see it everywhere. You're like, oh, oh, yeah, there, there it is. There it is. There, everybody's got Toyotas now. It's not true, but that's what we see. You know, we see that bias 
when you study scripture as well, you'll learn something that jumps out to you about who God is. And you're like, oh, oh, God is gracious. Oh, he's gracious. He forgives my sin, which is true. And then you begin to see it everywhere in scripture. And then you'll find out these scriptures and they're like, oh, God's judging people. No, he's gracious. There must be something wrong with that part of the scripture. And you continue to read on. We do it. We do. It's actually how we get all of our weird theological beliefs. I believe it's just simply that. You know, it's about, about grace. Or some will see prosperity everywhere. Others will be of the opposite. It's poverty everywhere. Some are healing. It's all about healing. He heals everyone. And others are like, nope, it's about suffering. Everybody suffers. And, and they have all of these things. That it's like, it's this, it's this, it's this. And then we'll read through scripture and we'll try and sanitize the stories we don't like. Half the Old Testament, nope. Glue, Song of Solomon, shut. Leviticus, <laughs> no thank you. We're going to keep going all the way through, right? Why, why are we doing that? Why are we doing that? It's revelation bias. And we're creating an image of God using his word. You know, we misinterpret, we misunderstand. Sometimes we have to twist the scripture to fit our belief of him rather than just allowing it to determine our understanding of who he is. Because he's grace and truth. He's mercy and he's justice. He's faith and he's works. You know, that's the thing that we just like, oh, he's one or the other. And if we get to that spot, we end up creating these, these ideas, these foolish ideas. You know, and then you'll run into people who challenge you. You know, and they'll say, hey, you know, God's actually like this. And you're like, no, I know the truth. Fine then, let's make our own denominations. And we go our own ways. You're not realizing, you know, that each and every one of us, as you have a revelation of who he is, you have a tidbit of the whole. You've got the tiniest crumb of the bakery. And to not say, oh, I guess it doesn't matter. It's just to realize, oh, man, the amount that I get to know of him, I begin to realize there's a whole lot more that I need to learn. I was thinking about it, you know, like we get those things and we're like, aha, I got it. I got it. I think we need to follow that, Uh aha, because we need those, Uh aha, we need to follow that up with, oh, hmm, there's more to learn, Uh aha, I got, oh, hmm, yeah, there's more, there's more to learn, man, and that's the great thing about doing Bible studies together, you know, you're like, I think about these, even the, the, the famous guys, like Martin Luther. Martin Luther was one of these guys. Like as He was like, aha, the just shall live by faith. And he reads and he reads and he reads and he comes to James. He's like, this is, this is the epistle of straw. I'm voting that we take it out of the Bible. Why? Because we all have that temptation and tendency to do it. Paul reminds the Corinthians and us that we don't know it all yet. We'll just throw this one on the screen. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. Paul said this. He says, now... In our present state, we see things imperfectly. I think we would agree with that. We, we don't have it all together. It's like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then, someday, we'll see everything with perfect clarity. There will be a day we're like, oh yeah, okay, we, we get it. And he says, all that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. There are some who would look at this and say, oh, that, you know, Paul was talking about when the Bible was finally written, we would know him completely. Well, the Bible is fully written, and there's people who do not know him completely. There will be a time when we are redeemed, when we see him face to face, and be like, oh, I am known, and I have the chance to know. To humbly simply remember, the humbly remember, the more that we know, it just reveals there's more to know. And that's what Jesus is helping Simon with in this moment, to understand what God is really like. You know, as we go back to Luke 7 for a minute, Simon, he says, Simon, he says, you look at this woman and you've got these things. And if, if you were a prophet, he's like, Simon, let me tell you something. God is the God who forgives sins. He forgives hers and yours. He says it this way, Luke 7, 47. He says, I tell you, Simon, her sins, and there are many. I mean, you, you know, you, you, you were accusing her in your mind and, and thinking that if, if this person was a godly person, they should be like distancing themselves from her. He's like, Simon, I tell you, her sins, they're many, but they've been forgiven. And that's why she's shown me much love. But a person who's forgiven little shows only little love. He had just condemned Simon for not doing anything for him, not washing his feet, not, not giving it. He's like, Simon, you, you're the one who loves little because you think you've been forgiven little, but there is no such thing. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And the men at the table said among themselves, 
who's this man that he's going around forgiving sins? Like, who does, who, who does he think he is? Only God does that. Who's this man going around forgiving sins? It's a great question because he's more than just a prophet. Jesus was and is God and he was revealed as the son. Uh, well, I want to read one last scripture to us tonight and then leave you with one last thought. Go to Colossians chapter one. So just to the turn to the right, um, Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Why do I want you to turn there? Because I want his word to enlighten us about who he is. I don't want you to just like, oh, well, Mark said, because that's how we get wrong in the first place. Let's just allow his word to just determine. If you got a highlighter, just underline it all. Colossians 1, verse 15 to 22. June, I expect the Bible app to be like flooded with all kinds of uh, pictures and verses tonight. All right, here we go. Colossians 1. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. You can't see him. You don't know what he looks like. You're like, man, I, I want to try and picture what he's like. He's like, let me help you out. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created. He is supreme over all creation. It is about him. Here we are again in the beginning. God, it's where, he, it's where Jesus was. Verse 16, for through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things that we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him was created through him, and it's all for him. Everything includes everything, including me and you, created through him and for him. I've been created for him. He existed before anything else. He holds all creation together. He's also the head of the church, which is his body. He's the beginning. He's supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all of his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on that cross. And this includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. There's a verse we don't want in there. Like, no, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be like enemies with God. Let's just, we're, we're good people. Not according to him. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he brought you into his own presence and you were holy you're blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. It's like, man, what he's done for me is incredible. This is God's story. And I think if anything tonight, if you forget everything, just remember this one picture. His story includes us, but it's about him. His story, by the grace of God, includes us, but it is about him. It is about him, not what he can do for me, what he's, gonna, what he's done for me. This is what he's done for me. It's about him, his purposes, his plans, his glory, him. And in those brief moments when people in Scripture catch a glimpse of this and understand this, we find their responses reflected. Think about Job, Job 42, verse 5. He's like, now that I see, he's like, I'd only heard before other people talking about you, but now I see you. Isaiah says in Isaiah 6, 5, he's like when he sees the throne room, he's like, whoa, whoa is me. Man, I'm like, I'm, a, I'm a, a man of unclean lips. I'm ruined. Luke 5 talks about Peter, and when Peter meets him, he's like, go away from me, Lord. I'm a, I'm a sinful man. John 3, verse 3, John the Baptist simply says, hey, just verse 30, he's like, he must increase, I must decrease. When I get around him, I know that he's the one. And in our North American Christianity, I think we flipped the script for so long, it's subconsciously there that we continually think in a way that makes him in our image. And over the next number of weeks, we'll be talking about a bunch of the ways we do that, how we pray, what, how we treat circumstances in our life, what we think about hell. I'm finally going to do it. <laughs> Don't want to miss it. What is it? It's God's story. It's God's story that points to him through Jesus. 
found this message of this week I was listening to by Dr. J. Howard Eatington. I don't know if he's related to Bob and Betty, but maybe. This message is from, from 1983. It's my last thoughts for you tonight. And I want to just, I mean, they're his thoughts, but I was like, I can't write it any better. And he says this about Jesus. The Bible calls him man, God, son of man, son of God, son of David, the Messiah, the good shepherd, the divine physician, the prophet, the high priest, the king, the cornerstone, the bridegroom, the bread of life and the light of the world. He is the door. He's the vine of which we are the branches. He's the judge of the living and the dead. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the great mediator, the, for, the forerunner, the scapegoat, the beloved one, the chosen one, the just one, the one who is to come. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the bright and morning star. He is the foundation of the world. He is the Lord. He is the Savior. He is the one in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He is the Christ. He is Jesus. And this Jesus shall save his people from their sins. Man, may, <laughs> may that inspire our worship. None of the, God, what have you done for me lately? It doesn't matter. This is who you are. Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see the truth. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. You know, it's amazing to think that we have been made in his image. It's never the other way around. As we move on in the next number of weeks... Maybe this is the question, why does it matter? Leave you with a few thoughts to ponder. It is this, it matters because a God that's made in my image doesn't actually exist. If you're praying to a God in your image, it's as good as the wooden idol. It's not gonna, there's nothing there. You know, a God in our image is one we think we can control because he's just like us. You know, a God we think we know and understand no longer requires us to pursue him, to know him. And I'm amazed at how many Christians don't read their Bible, but I think I now know why. They already think they're God. They got a God that they've created. They don't need to learn anymore. And a God made in our image is just simply too small to save us. In our gut, in our heart of hearts, we realize that is not the God we want. And even though there may be tough stuff I read along the way, I just want to know the truth. I want to know the true God, the real God. Like Paul, he says, I don't know it all yet, but man, I want to know him. Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ. I want to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. There is a desire in us to know God, and there's a desire in God to reveal himself to us through Christ, through the word, through his Holy Spirit. Man, I pray. I pray that that affects us this week as we read his word to simply know him. Let's pray, Father. Thank you that we can know you as Father. Jesus, thank you for revealing that. Jesus, thank you for being our Savior. Oh, how quickly we take that for granted. Lord, as we are just aware of it tonight, we just humbly admit there are many, many times we've created an image of you that suits our needs, suits our purposes. Father, we repent. We change our mind. We ask that you would renew us, wash us with your word, renew our minds by your word that we may know the truth. Lord, with all the voices going on around us, those vying for our attention in, the, in religion and in the world, would you give us ears to hear yours? As we read your word, would you open our eyes to see? Open our ears to hear. Give us minds to understand. Lord, we can't even do it without you. Holy Spirit, that is our prayer for this week. That you would lead and guide us in the knowledge of you. That we would simply see your story. And just gratefully, gratefully thank you for being included in it. Lord, may your plans and your purposes and your kingdom May they continue to come. May the, your will continue to be done. Your will be done. I just pray this in your name, Jesus. The name above all names. May you be glorified. Amen.
Amen. Well, I hope this gives you something to think about tonight. And if not, I have four questions for you that you can take home with you. What jumped out? Have you noticed some of these things yourself? And uh, man, I'd love to chat with you more. I, I had somebody last week say, hey, you know what? After the service, I, he said, I want to go for coffee with you. I think we need to chat. Those are my favorite conversations. Some people think, oh, he's always too busy. I'm not too busy. I would love nothing more than to do that. And if I'm too busy, I'll send Zach. So <laughs> it's win-win. Um, but thank you for being here tonight. If you're here and you want like someone to pray with you, I'd love to do that. Zach would as well. Otherwise, uh, go grab your kids from downstairs. Feel free to hang out here. Chat with some people. It's a good way to make community. And we will uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks for being here.